What's cracking, YouTube? Welcome back to the channel. You know it's your boy Nicholas, representing Big Dogs. You gotta eat fantasy football. I just wanna show you how beautiful it is out here, how beautiful life is. I'm out here in San Diego, California. You know, I'm just traveling the world, trying different drugs and girls. We are gonna get back into my early rankings videos. We did quarterbacks, running backs, wide receivers already, so if you miss any of those, they'll be linked in the description. Today, we're gonna dive into my top 10 early rankings for tight ends. Before we do that though, I might be working on something major, something huge for y'all, or a very, very select few exclusive group of y'all. I'm talking about nine guys, 10 including myself. Very preliminary. I might be working on getting 10 of us together for an in-person live fantasy football draft this summer. Getting the boys together, nine of y'all, one of me, forget the wives, forget the kids, forget the girlfriends. We're gonna boogie for a weekend. I'm talking about Friday, Saturday, Sunday. We live draft on Sunday, but before that, we're gonna have a lot of fun, man. We might be talking about getting Airbnb in New York City. So if you ain't been to the New York City yet, this is a good opportunity for you. We might grab like 30 cases of beer. We might hit all you can drink, boozy margarita brunch on Saturday morning. I might know the best place in the city. Man, this is gonna be a dope, dope, dope weekend. And I want to share it with nine of you guys. Cause listen, man, I don't know. I don't know if you guys know a lot about my life if you don't watch my vlogs, but I'm very into my business and my marketing. And this weekend was a killer weekend for me in terms of planning for the future. And I'm really looking to change the fantasy football industry over the next two to three years. And I really think I could do that. What my plan is to build up the online community, right? The online audience. The reason I wanna do that is so that I could take it offline. I wanna connect with you guys. I want to meet you guys. I want to hang out with y'all, man. I wanna bring you offline. And I think that's the ultimate goal for me as, as it should be for a lot of creators. But this is a way I can do that, man. I've been trying to think of different creative ways to do that. And I think this is gonna be a dope weekend. It's gonna be a package for nine of you guys. It's gonna be super exclusive. So I need to make sure that y'all have interest. I'm really trying to change the industry and do something crazy here. So if, if you're with your boy and you might be interested in what I'm talking about, getting together for a weekend, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, drop a comment below and let me know. Otherwise, I don't want to, uh, I don't want to throw this idea out there and uh, have it slap back in my face like a damn yo-yo, you know what I'm saying? So drop a comment if you're in for this. I could follow up with more details and whatnot. While you're down there, hit the thumbs up video before we start, but let's get cracking on my top 10 tight ends for the 2018 fantasy football season. We're gonna switch it over here because I think the backdrop be much better. Nice and serene, so you could just focus on me. You could have a peaceful, when am I gonna release this? Probably gonna be Sunday. Peaceful Sunday, yeah. So let's talk tight ends, right? I freaking hate the tight end position in fantasy football. There's nothing I like less than having to choose a tight end or having to draft a tight end or stream a tight end or whatnot. And a lot of people compare tight ends to quarterbacks because you could stream both of those guys because you only start one of them, right? In most leagues. However, you could stream quarterbacks because a lot of them are good right? Quarterbacks five through 15 are all separated by a point per game. That's the same thing with the tight ends, except they all suck, right? So it's important to be able to nail your tight ends. Important to be able to know which ones are going to let you eat for the year. Thus is why I'm making this video. Because the obvious ones, you know, the gronks of the world are the ones you have to pay draft capital for. The rest of them, however, are not so easy to hit on, and I would like to consider myself somewhat of a tight end whisperer. So, without further ado, let's get into my top tight end rankings. Top 10 early for 2018 fantasy football. Number one should come to no surprise that it is Rob Gronkowski. He is year over year the tight end one on a points per game basis. So if he's in your lineup, he is the tight end one overall. It's not close. He's number one off the board right now, according to current ADP. It's going off at... 20 overall. And I don't understand why his ADP keeps getting pushed back year over year. He's not retiring. Brady is still there. He's still elite. Like, I don't know. Y'all are crazy. I I'm all in on, on Gronk again this year. If I can get him at pick 20, he's very, he's so bike. He's so bike. I don't know what y'all are doing. So we'll move on to number two. And this probably won't come as a, as much of a surprise to you guys. It's, it's Kelsey, man. I love me some Kelsey. However, I don't love him at his current ADP of pick 23. He is tight end too, which I agree with, but 23rd pick overall, that's like, 
That's late second round for you 12 teamers, man. The thing is, like, we know what we're getting from Gronk when he's healthy. And I, I like Kelsey, I really do, but there are some question marks and some variables that are going into the Chiefs offense in 2018. The biggest of them being Alex Smith's departure. Patrick Holmes gets left the keys to the kingdom, the Kansas City Kingdom. And what's that mean? Now, I'm not, this is not an indictment on Patrick Mahomes. I, I actually am probably on the side where I think he's going to be a good quarterback. However, it's still an unknown. You don't know if they're going to you know, pull back the reins on the offense. Maybe that's why they're, they're signing so many running backs because they know it's going to be a heavy workload on the ground. And uh, they don't let him throw as much or, or air the ball out as much. I know he's got a great arm and a cannon arm and he has a great deep ball. But I'm just saying, I'm just throwing out ideas. These are red flags and cautions. The biggest piece, uh, you know, that you could take away from going into 2018 is the fact that they bring in Sammy Watkins, who is a possession receiver. Tariq Hill's still going to be the wide receiver one there in Kansas City. Sammy Watkins will be the wide receiver two on the outside is a guy who commands more medium over the middle, uh, those types of targets, right? He was a good deep threat for Tyrod Taylor, but he was literally the best threat anywhere on the field for them, right? Deep, short, route, slant, bap, beep, bop, boop, everywhere with Sammy Watkins. They don't need him to do that in this offense. Remember Jeremy Macklin a few years ago, he was very successful with the Chiefs, um, and Watkins could play a similar role to that, probably with less volume, but nonetheless, the same thing, and I think it eats into the targets of Kelsey. So if you're okay with taking Kelsey 23rd overall, I think you're like very much on the side that you think Pat Mahomes is going to be at minimum exactly what Alex Smith was last year, if not much better. And you have to assume that Sammy Watkins' target totals are not going to eat into Tyree, uh, to Travis Kelsey's, which is is a ridiculous thing to think because Kelsey led the entire NFL in tight end targets, right? He had like 122 targets last year. And of course, volume always plays into fantasy football. If those targets dip, if he goes back down to like 100 targets or something, you can bet that his production is going to fall off a little bit. So I have him at two. I'm not comfortable taking him at 23 overall. That's very, very high for uh, for a tight end. So I would just bear some caution if you're looking at Kelsey in the mid-20s. And I'd probably hold back until uh, late third, fourth round on another tight end. And the thing about it is uh, you have, th this is kind of what the point is getting to. Number three in my rankings is Zach Ertz of the Philadelphia Eagles. He is also going off the board as tight end three right now, according to ADP. Going off the board 31st pick overall. So the thing I uh, I really, do I don't like Ertz at this spot either. I don't, I hate him actually at pick 31. This is basically like this, having Kelsey and Ertz with their ADP so close to Gronk, in my opinion, makes Gronk that much more valuable. Because think of it this way. Like imagine Le'Veon Bell, Melvin Gordon, Devonta Freeman were all getting picked very close to each other. But there's a clear, clear advantage with one of them, right? They're all good players, but there's a clear positional advantage with Le'Veon Bell over the other two. That's how I see Gronk here, because Gronk is the only one that you know exactly what you're getting from. It's high-end, elite-level production. And I'm not sure you know that with Kelsey's question marks between Watkins and Patrick Mahomes, and then Zach Ertz, who at pick 30 is still very high for a tight end. I don't think, here's the problem with Ertz. People think last year was a breakout year for him. It was not. I want you to look at the numbers from the last three seasons, 2017, 2016, 2015. The only thing that changed was the number of touchdowns. He had two, he doubled that to four, and then doubled that to eight last year. And that is why everyone's like, oh my God, Zach Ertz, Zach Ertz, Zach Ertz. Yes, he is a very good mid to high level fantasy tight end. However, he has nowhere near the ceiling that Gronk has. Look at the numbers. So these numbers are his targets, receptions, and yards over the last three seasons, starting in 2015. There is almost no difference. So you are betting on his touchdowns to be up there again. And based on his career historical numbers, uh, the eight was, I'm not going to say it's an outlier because I would expect him probably to score around five, six uh, touchdowns, but he clearly is in the same ballpark for yards, receptions, and targets year in and year out. So in a game where, especially for receivers, touchdowns fluctuate greatly, I'm not willing to bet a 31st overall pick on it, right? That's your third round pick, pretty much. Um, and you look at other guys who are going at the same spot. Joe Mixon, Doug Baldwin, Josh Gordon, Stefan Diggs, all going later than Zach Ertz. So you're telling me that if you're okay with picking Zach Ertz ahead of those guys, you would rather 830 yards 
830 yards than a guy like Joe Mixon who has 1,400 yard upside. The better argument is the fact that Joe Mixon's floor is not even 800 yards. It's probably 900 to 1,000 yards given the volume he's gonna get this year. So how are you gonna take Zach Ertz to 31 considering he's gonna put up 800, 850 yards when you know those other guys are basically, that's their floor. That, that's, that's the problem I have with Ertz here. Again, he's my tight end three, but him at pick 30 is just way, 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 way too high. So in the wise words of my man, Randy Jackson, that's gonna be a no for me, dog. So we also have Carson Wentz, right? He is coming back from the knee injury. He's expected to be back for week one. We don't know. Um, either way, I, I don't think it's much of a drop off Foles. The Wentz for Ertz, the, it doesn't really play a major role in my opinion on the guy. We see the connection there with, with Wentz, so hopefully he's back. If not, it's whatever. Uh, they lose Trey Burton through free agency and Brent Selleck, uh, but they draft Dallas Godart, who is Godart, Godart, I don't know, Yogurt, Yodart. Who's going to be the tight end two there now. I really liked him. I wish he went to a team that he would get early opportunity in, but he didn't. And uh, I, I think it's kind of a wash there losing a guy like Trey Burton, but bringing in Dallas Godark, who who is a really good all-around tight end, a great pass catcher. So nothing there for me. Um, and again, the, the touchdowns are what get me. Oh, I forgot I have this down here. This is a good one. You guys listen up and listen goddamn close. He scored eight touchdowns last year. <clears throat> all eight of them were on red zone targets. He had 18 red zone targets in total last year. So, 18 red zone targets last year. Eight of his eight touchdowns came on those 18 targets. In 2016, he scored four touchdowns. All four of them were red zone targets. He had 17 red zone targets in total. So, what you're saying is he had pretty much the exact same red zone target total in 2016 as 2017. So, it's not as if his volume and his participation in the offense, especially down by the scoring zone, changed. So that's not a predictive measure or value that you would expect next year, right? If he, if he had the same amount of targets in 2016 as he did 2017 in the red zone, but scored half the touchdowns, what's not to say that doesn't happen again next year? And that touchdown total dropped from eight back down to four or to six or to five or anything like that. So it's not as if his touchdown total jumped because instead of 17 red zone targets, he saw 28 and you're like, wow, you know what? He's a huge piece of that offense. No, it stayed the same, which tells me that the touchdowns are going to fluctuate and uh, you can't depend on high volume because he's had the same volume. You know what I mean? And that's the point I'm kind of trying to get across here. So pick 31, just don't do it with Hurts, man. Just don't. <sighs> number four, number four, number four, number four, number four, number four. This is, this is my favorite tight end this year to grab. I'll probably own him on basically every one of my teams. He's currently going off the board 71st overall as tight end seven. Hunter Henry is my tight end four for the Los Angeles Chargers. I love Hunter Henry this year in the worst way or in the best way. I don't know. Whatever you want to say, he's going to be on every one of my damn teams. He's a guy that's... I think he's pretty much just as likely to put up Ertz's numbers last year as Ertz is this year. And you can get him for about 40 picks after. Literally 40 picks later is where Hunter Henry's going after Zach Ertz. We have the official news, Antonio Gates is not coming back as a Charger next year. He is done with the Los Angeles Chargers. That finds Henry in just an absolutely gorgeous position to break out this year. Gates, you know, as much as he was a shell of himself last year and he was old and you might say like, ah, you know what, like Henry should have done it last year if Gates really wasn't even, you know, who he is as a player. I don't think people realize just how much opportunity Gates actually got in the offense last year. Despite playing on less than 47% of the Chargers snaps, he was the second most targeted tight end in the 10 zone last year. Jimmy Graham, who led all NFL players, was the only tight end who had more targets inside the 10-yard line than Antonio Gates. Get that through y'all's heads. Gates was still very much impacting Hunter Henry's bottom lines, especially in terms of touchdowns. That's a lot of opportunity that's going to be available for Hunter Henry, man. I absolutely love him. I think they brought in Virgil Green. Virgil Green is a blocking tight end. They asked Hunter Henry to actually block a pretty good amount. And uh, this is, okay, so my man Noah Pyers, one of the guys I brought on to blog with me for BDGE, for the brand, did his first article, which will be, will should be up already if you're watching this video. It's the winners and losers of the NFL draft from the quarterback and tight end position. 
I'm gonna break this down for you. If you are not following him on Twitter, please go do yourself a favor and do that. This, this kid's got a lot of promise in the industry. If he keeps working, he is going to make it. First article he wrote for me was absolutely killer and this is a piece from him. I will link his Twitter right below. It'll be the first thing in the description here. Last year, Hunter Henry lined up as a blocker on 49.6% of snaps per pro football focus. Antonio Gates, on the other hand, only did so on 32% of his snaps. Virgil Green blocked on 72.6% of his snaps last year. So he is a very willing blocker and should be used heavily in that aspect of the game for the Chargers, which means Henry, while he's blocking on a lot of his plays, won't be asked to block as much because when you have a guy like Gates who can't really block anymore, you have to ask Henry to block a lot. Now you bring in a guy like Virgil Green who blocks a lot and you don't have to ask so much of Henry there. So without Gates, not only is he not going to block as much, he's gonna run more routes, he's gonna see a lot more opportunity in the red zone and the 10 zone, man. Uh, this isn't even a question for me. Uh, Henry was tight end six on a points per game basis last year with Antonio Gates. Now he's getting picked as tight end seven, man. Y'all never cease to blow my MF mind. Number five, we move into Evan Ingram. New York Giants tight end. He's currently being picked number number five, tight end number five, ADP, 55th overall. Ingram was a really tough one for me to get a read on, man. I wasn't sure what to make of him. He had a fantastic rookie year. Um, one of the best ever, actually, I believe. His, uh, I believe he was second ever among rookie tight ends in his receptions and his yards, 64 catches, 722 yards. Second most ever for a rookie tight end. You're gonna have to fact check that. So I might actually be lying to you, but it was a very good season nonetheless. And my immediate reaction was this, was, okay, well, he did that because OBJ missed a lot of time. Brandon Marshall missed a lot of time. Sterling Shepard missed a good portion of time. Uh, this team was very bad and they had to throw the ball a lot, which left basically Shepard as their only weapon, thus leading him to be the second most targeted tight end in the entire league, only behind Kelsey. Ingram had uh, 115 targets. That was my first reaction. I'm like, there's no way he can repeat those numbers given what happened to the wide receiver position in New York last year and their team overall. Um, while that's true, Ingram had only a 20% target share on the offense, which is not huge. It's not huge, not a crazy number. It was the sixth most among tight ends last year. Um, and 20% is actually semi-repeatable. That's my second instinct after finding those statistics. Uh, but it's going to be much harder with Odell Beckham back and Saquon Barkley coming in, who is an elite pass catching running back. But I think the biggest takeaway piece of analysis here is what you guys need to listen to is this little statistic I found. So like I said, Ingram was the sixth highest target share total among tight ends last year. The five tight ends that finished with a higher market target share on their respective teams were Travis Kelsey, Jack Doyle, Gronk, Delaney Walker, and Zach Ertz. Not only did they lead their teams, they all led their teams, right? They were the highest in tight ends, also led their teams. None of them had a player on their team with more than 22% of the target share. Um, and that was T.Y. Hilton with Jack Doyle. The problem here is while I say the 20% is repeatable for Sterling Shepard, Odell Beckham has never had a season where he saw less than 27% of the team's targets. So all those tight ends who saw higher target market share than Ingram. They also didn't have a guy competing for targets like he will have with OBJ. Um, like I said, OBJ has never had a season under 27% target share. So I'm wrestling with the idea that Ingram's piece of the pie is reasonable, that 20% target market share, even if it drops down to like 18%, he's still a pretty good value at tight end five, tight end six in that range. But in reality, it's probably, you know, it, it's, I don't know. I, I I'm leaning towards the side where I don't want Ingram at his price. I think he's a very good tight end, um, but I'm siding with the fact that he's gonna be overrated this year in fantasy football. So drop a comment down below. What are your thoughts on, after hearing that piece from me, what are your thoughts on Ingram this year? I still like him a lot as a player, and I think he's gonna be really good for the Giants in the future. This year, I think he's gonna be a little overrated though. So that wraps up five. That's my top five right there. We had Gronk, Kelsey, Ertz, Henry, and Evan Ingram. Before we move on to number six, a word from the sponsor of this video. We have fantasyjocks.com. You all know they always sponsor the videos and I gotta show them love for that. They are the industry leader, the number one leader in fantasy football equipment for your league. They just released their new draft kits. 
So they have live draft boards. If your boys are getting together and you guys draft live, this is where you need to be getting your board. It's great, it comes with this whole kit of koozies and, and they even have a kit now with a mini championship belt if you wanna throw a few extra bucks into that. You can go look at the championship belts by themselves, the really nice ones. You can throw in an extra 12 or 15 bucks a person depending on how many guys are in your league and you can get that belt for life. The thing is incredible. You've seen me wear it before in my videos. I use it for my big money league. This thing's awesome. It's great to just carry that shit around when you guys watch football together on Sundays. Your, your friends are gonna get pissed off if you're wearing that thing. And I think that's the whole point. Winners win, losers lose, right? They got trophies, they got Lombardi trophies, the football trophies, all really, really super high quality stuff here. So um, definitely check out fantasyjocks.com. They will be linked in the description below. If you need anything for your league, rings, trophies, belts, draft boards, chip in, have everyone in your league throw an extra five bucks and you got yourself cracking for the 2018 season. So again, thank you Fantasy Jocks for sponsoring this video. And we're gonna move on to number six. Tight end number six. <sighs> That's Greg Olson. Carolina Panthers. Another, this whole mid section of tight ends was a tough one to get a read on. He's currently going off the board as tight end four, pick number 54. So he's one pick ahead of Evan Ingram, basically in the exact same spot as Ingram. You get your pick of who you want there. I would never thought I'd see the day when G Reg gets head, kind of falls off the fantasy football pedestal, off his greatness. But that's what happened in 2017. After not missing a single game for nine straight years, he hadn't missed a game since his rookie year. Um, played in 16 straight games in nine straight seasons. It, it came to an end last year, man. I'm sad about that. I love, I love G Rig. He ended up breaking his foot, fracturing a bone in his foot, which caused him to miss nine games last year. But then he came back for the final four games, and it was weird because he had two games where he absolutely exploded, right? He had stat lines of nine for 116 in a touchdown and eight for 107 in a touchdown. That's like really, 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 really good numbers. Then he had two absolute dud games where he caught three balls for 27 yards and one ball for 10 yards. Um, and I think the more important thing to take away from this is not that he had the dud games, but the fact that he was still very much, even at his age, given the injury, able to put up those monster eight, nine catch, 110 yard games and touchdowns. So I think that's the thing you need to take away from. Right now, he's saying he's fully healthy. He said he's ready to go for the 2018 season. The Panthers backed those words up by signing him through a uh, contract extension through 2020. So they're still fully confident in him. He's still confident in himself. I think this ADP, uh, ADP 54 overall, th this is actually exactly where he was going last year, almost to a T. I think one pick, give or take. Um, so the fantasy world seems to agree that he is fine. And I'm definitely okay with Olsen as a mid-round tight end. Not super pumped about it, given, you know, they add DJ Moore, they add Jarius Wright, they have Curtis Samuel coming back, they add Torrey Smith to the mix. So they, they bring in a lot of weapons, but I think Greg Olson is like his own target share by himself. And I don't think those other guys will really have a, a huge effect on him. So Olson's a guy that, you know, I think he's a good value here. I think he's going to return about where, where you pick him at as tight end six is probably the value that he's going to return. And if he's fully healthy... Um, then he obviously has those upside games where he can throw up eight for 100 and a touchdown for you, which you don't see often with guys like um, Zach Ertz and guys, the rest of the guys on this list. So Olsen's a guy that I, I do like a tight end six, and he's he, I'm very debated between Ingram and Greg Olsen. Depending on what the, the, the picks before those picks were, that's probably going to decide whether I want upside or floor. Number seven, Delaney Walker, Tennessee Titans tight end. Tennessee Titans tight end. That's a lot of T's, bro. He's going off the board as tight end eight right now, overall 75. I have him as tight end seven. It was the fourth consecutive year last year where he finished inside the position's top 10. Top seven, I excuse me. A top seven fantasy tight end. Uh, he led the Titans in targets, receptions, and yards. Finished as tight end six last year. Finished with 74 catches, 807 yards. The big fall off here was the touchdown number, three touchdowns. But 74 catches, 807 yards, very identical to Zach Ertz. It's also the fourth time in as many years that Walker's had 800 plus receiving yards. Four straight years of 800 plus. That's pretty good. He, he turns 34 in all. 30, 34, 34 in August. 34 years old in August. So in my opinion, you could easily have argued that even at his old age, he should have had a much better stat line than he did last year. And I chalk that up to the fact that Mariota was garbage last year. That whole offense was was brutal to watch as well as own a piece in, in fantasy football. Um, Mariota took a step back. I don't know if it was the coaching staff. I don't know if it was an injury he was dealing with. I don't know what it was. But the Tennessee Titans quarterback, Mar Mariota, 
finished with less than 220 passing yards in 9 of 15 games. So two-thirds of his games, I don't even think that's the right math, but three-fifths of his games, he finished with 220 passing yards or less, which is not good for a quarterback in today's day and age. At five of them, he had less than 185 passing yards. So it's not like Walker could have, unless he's getting a 28, 30% target share, he's not going to be able to put up monster numbers. But what's good to see is he was still very heavily involved in the, in, in the market share in terms of targets on the team. Team high, 24% of targets. Over the last four years, he's never seen less than a 21% share, which on its own would have been top five last year for tight ends in, uh, in 2017, 21% of the target market share on his team. And the four-year averages of the last four years for Delaney Walker is 23.5%, which is would have been one of the tops in the league last year. So still very heavily involved. You have Eric Decker leaving. And you have Corey Davis, who people assume is going to take a bigger chunk of that target share. So not that I think that's an exact wash there, uh, but Delaney Walker is still a huge piece of this offense, still getting his targets. Decker did command 17% of the team's targets last year. So that's not like a, you don't scoff at, at, at that number. So with him gone, that opens up opportunity for Davis and Walker to still uh, be productive in this offense. The other thing we need to consider here is the coaching changes in Tennessee. They bring in Mike Vrabel, who was the former Texans defensive coordinator, as the head coach, uh, which just doesn't really tell us much about the offense because I don't think he's going to be. He's the defensive-minded coach. He probably won't be calling the plays, which will be left to Matt LaFleur. Great hire by Tennessee. Uh, LaFleur has worked with Kyle Shanahan and then under Sean McVay last year as the Rams offensive coordinator. So he's working under two of the best offensive-minded young head coaches in the NFL, and now he's going off on his own to be the offense coordinator here in Tennessee. And both of those teams, if you look at it, had so many weapons outside of the tight end position that they didn't need to lean on tight end whatsoever between Atlanta and the Rams last year. Crazy weapons. Now you go to the Tennessee Titans, where I think this is a great fit for, for Walker in, in the sense that it's going to be an up-tempo offense, and Walker's a guy with really good speed at the position. Even at his old age, he still can and can break linebackers up the seam, and he moves well after the catch. So put him in space, let him do his thing, and this is uh, an offense that will be utilizing him in the passing game for sure. And I think, it's, I think he's just set up to keep doing what he's been doing and being consistent mid pick at the tight end position who will give you good games, right? If Mario can bounce back and throw some goddamn touchdowns rather than the 13 touchdowns he threw last year, Walker's in a good spot to uh, to bounce back heavily. So don't underrate him. And we move to number eight. This one might take a lot of y'all by surprise, but I love my boy George Kittle out in San Francisco. Currently being picked as tight end 15. And I think the more that people talk about him as a sleeper and, a, and, and like me, you know, he'll move up the draft board. He's going 120 overall. He is my favorite non-obvious, you know, Hunter Henry tight end to pick this year. And he will end up on a lot of my teams that I don't pick a tight end early in the draft on. I think he'll unquestionably return value where you get him in tight end 15. Couple him with Jimmy, Jimmy GQ as a starter in San Fran. You got Kyle Shanahan. You look how Kittle ended the 2017 season on a tear for the tight end position. Rattling off games of four catches, 52 yards, three catches, 42 yards, and a touchdown, and then four catches and a hundred. Throw that hundred up. That's how we. That's how we rattled off the end of the season last year when Jimmy GQ was finally getting on a roll and was the starter there for the last five six games. Kittle did well, and then you look at his metrics. I don't know if you know a lot of you guys know about Kittle or if you just know the name. He is a specimen at the position. He didn't finish with eye popping numbers last year. 43 for 515 and two touchdowns, but but low key the receptions and the yardages 43 for 515 the yardages uh, they rank second among all rookie tight ends only behind Ingram his you know his two touchdowns obviously weren't fun for the owners but the red zone targets 16 and 7 10 zone targets were definitely encouraging to see of uh, as a piece of this offense going forward just look at you know look at 64 250 good size but the metrics man. 40-yard dash, 96th percentile. Speed score, 94th percentile. Burst score, 89th percentile. Agility and catch rate is 9,500th percentile. 89th percentile, spark score. College dominator, 72nd percentile. Just really good all-around numbers, man. And when we dig deeper, last year, there were 30 tight ends with at least 40 targets. 30 tight ends with at least 40 targets. Among the 30 tight ends, Kittle ranked fourth in yards after catch, 7th in yards per target, and 12th in yards per reception. You have to love that yard after catch number, man. 
because tight ends who can't move around only depend on touchdowns. And when you have a guy like Jimmy GQ, uh, I think there's a, there's a floor with touchdowns. And when you can make plays on your own, like Kittle, who is a, an athletic beast for a tight end, there's a lot of upside there. So they're going to throw a ton. Um, only three quarterbacks in the entire NFL last year threw the ball more than Jimmy GQ over the last five weeks of the season. And I think that's like the trend we're going to see with Kyle Shanahan and Jimmy GQ going into this year. A very heavily high passing touchdown team. Um, oh, and, and circling back on this, I know this is super random, but it just popped into my head. So one of the other argument for when I was talking about Evan Ingram, right? When I said I was so twisted on whether or not I want to go for him or against him. One of the arguments people were making was you can't possibly repeat the numbers because the Giants threw the ball so much because they were trailing a lot, right? But when, when you look back, this, this Giants team has historically been a really high volume passing offense for the last couple of years. So they didn't really throw the ball that much more this year than they did the last couple of years, even though they had been, re- even though they were really bad this year and not as bad the other year. So um, it's not like, oh, I expect them to be so much better. They're going to run the ball so much more. And they probably will with Barkley, but they still will pass the ball a ton. I don't know why I just went off on that tangent. But we move past George Kittle at number eight. We move to Kyle Rudolph at number nine. Minnesota Vikings being picked at tight end number nine. Overall, 79. Um, another one kind of to get a tough read on only because of the changes that happened in Minnesota. But I think we have a pretty solid analysis on, on Rudolph and what he's going to give you now and what he's given you over the last few years. Finished last year with a 57, 532, eight touchdown stat line. Uh, in 2016, he had his career season, right? where he went for 84 catches, 840 yards, seven touchdowns. The 84 catches, 840 yards seems to be something very unrepeatable for Rudolph. So if, if you're like not banking on him, but but thinking he's going to bounce back to that way, I, I, I would kind of take your mind off of that. If you look at the year prior, 2015, it was much more like 2017. 49 catches, 495 yards, five touchdowns. So I think we're kind of seeing that that was an outlier of a year in 2016 and the Reception total and the yardage total is probably going to be between 50 and 60 catches, 500 and 600 receiving yards. I wanted to look at what was the main cause of the jump, right, in his in his numbers and what we should expect. So unsurprisingly, in 2016, his big year, his target share in Minnesota jumped to 23% of the targets. In 2015, that number was 16%. Last year, it was just 15% because we saw... Stefan Diggs and Adam Thielen emerge. And Thielen, I think, had like 27 or 28% target share there in Minnesota. Um, so could you expect Rudolph to get back to that 23% target share number that made him so valuable in fantasy? Very highly doubtful. You look at their offense as a whole. In 2015, they threw the ball 454 times, which was dead last in the NFL. 2016, that number jumped from 454 to 588. So they passed the ball a shit ton in 2016, which was 12th in the NFL. Last year, leaning on the run game, which is you know what they did a, a ton, even though they lost Alvin Cook, and I expect them to lean heavily on the run game this year with Alvin Cook back, they ranked 21st in the NFL. So in 2016, not only were they passing the ball a ton, way more than they historically do, but they threw the ball to Rudolph way more than they probably will be this year. So it was two really heavy things going for Rudolph that you can't reasonably expect to happen again in 20. Um, in 2018. Plus, this defense is just going to be so good, and they're and and they're going to be relying on the ground game, and they're not going to be asked to throw the ball a ton, right? When when their defense stops every team, they're not going to be airing the ball out, and it just I don't know. I just I just see Rudolph as someone who like doesn't really have a ceiling. He doesn't have a ceiling. He has a good floor, touchdown floor, probably six to eight touchdowns, maybe more, but his his ceiling is very low in terms of receptions and, and yardage. So. Um, you know they bring in Kirk as a Q, the quarterback, and that's the big, the big, the big change here, right? In Minnesota, um, and we saw how well Kirk played with Jordan Reed in Washington when Reed had that monster 2015 season. I think he had it was it 87 catches, 952 yards, 11 touchdowns. Reed is obviously a much better athlete than Kyle Rudolph is with the ball in his hands. Um, but the good part is Reed scored seven of his 11 touchdowns in the 10 zone, and or seven of his 11 touchdowns that year in the red zone. 10 of 11 in the 10 zone. So it's not like Reed was, you know, making plays from the 40 yard line that Rudolph is incapable of making. But if he's getting 10 of his touchdowns in the 10 zone, that's an area where Kyle Rudolph gets a lot of targets. So if Kirk Cousins is targeting his tight ends in the 10 zone, like he did with Reed, that's a good sign for Kyle Rudolph. And that's just more speaking of, again, his touchdown floor is probably pretty safe because he's going to be targeted in that area. 
So much better pick in standard leagues. Uh, pull back the reins a little bit in PPR, half PPR leagues. It's so way more likely we see Rudolph finish as the tight end seven to the tight end nine, where he's getting picked around, than it is that he doesn't. You know, so I think Rudolph is is almost this this next guy with uh, with a little bit less ceiling. That would bring us to Jimmy Graham of the Green Bay Packers. <sighs> I need to like gather myself before I lose it on this one. Currently being picked as tight end six. I'm not only leading the anti-Jimmy Graham hype train, but I'm hosting the motherfucking cookout when we get off the train. If I leave you with anything from this video, and I guess if you're watching fantasy football videos this early, you're probably you're probably in more competitive leagues, but if you're in friends and family leagues or non-competitive leagues, there will be someone in your league, in almost every league, you know, even in my competitive league, there will be someone who takes Jimmy Graham in like the fourth round maybe the fifth round tops. Do not be that guy. If I leave you here for this whole episode with anything, I don't even want, I don't even care about the draft day weekend anymore. I don't, that's not even fun anymore because I have to talk about Jimmy Graham. He ruins my mood. Don't pick him in the fourth round. Please do not do that to yourself. So the arguments for Jimmy Graham, he's with Aaron Rodgers and he's tall. That's it. So basically that automatically equates to 15, 12, 15 touchdowns for him this year. No. That point of view, I, I understand. I, I get it. It's understandable. Coming off this 10 touchdown season, which he led the NFL in, in tight end touchdowns, he moves over to the Packers, where he, he moves from, from Russell Wilson to, to Aaron Rodgers. Big difference here is Jimmy Graham is, one, he's just not the player he was, right? And I'll get into that later. But he led the NFL last year in red zone and end zone targets. Both red zone and end zone, or 10 zone, probably end zone targets too. Ridiculously heavily involved there. Um, the Seahawks didn't have literally anyone else they can go to. They didn't have a ground game. Their number one wide receiver, Doug Baldwin, is like 5'10", 5 5'11". 5 Who was their number two? Tyler Lockett, who's like 5'4". Paul Rich, they gave him the ball some, but Paul Rich is only like six foot also. He moves over to Green Bay. I, I listen to these numbers. So since Jimmy Graham entered the league in 2010, was it 2000? Yeah, I guess we, damn, 30, 2018. I'm old as shit. His per season averages, Jimmy Graham's per season averages, 19 and a half red zone targets, 10 10 zone targets, seven red zone touchdowns. In that same time span, 2010 to, to now with Aaron Rodgers, tight ends, the top tight end, the most productive fantasy, best fantasy tight end on the Green Bay Packers, season averages, 10 and a half red zone targets, which is basically half what Jimmy Graham has, five and a half 10 zone targets, also basically half, three red zone touchdowns which is less than half. How many consecutive seasons can we sit here and listen to y'all say, but this is by far the best tight end that Aaron Rodgers has ever played with. Like y'all sound so MF dumb. Jimmy Graham ain't shit anymore. He could barely move. He finished last year as tight end five in half PPR while leading tight ends in touchdowns with 10. He was first in touchdowns, 10th in receptions, 17th in receiving yards. That's really hard to do, to finish as the tight end five on a, in a position that so heavily relies on touchdowns. You lead that in touchdowns. How do you lead a position that relies on touchdowns and still finish all the way back at tight end five? You finish 17th in receiving yards. That is how. His yards per reception, he relies so heavily on touchdowns. His yards per receptions dipped from 14.2, a, a full five yards, 14.2 in 2016 to 9.1 in 2017. His yards after catch, which always rank low, 57th among 68 qualified to actually all tight ends last year in the NFL, 57th in yards after catch. He's going to rely solely on touchdowns in 2018 with a quarterback that does not rely on tight ends in the red zone. That is the, the take here. Say what you want about Jimmy Graham being the best tight end. Rodgers does not go to the tight end in that area of the field, man. Sure. Eight touchdowns is possible, maybe even matching the 10 touchdowns of last season, but that is absolutely best case scenario. And he did that best case scenario last year in Seattle and finished at tight end five. So the fact that he's going at tight end five, tight end six, he'll probably go at tight end five in a lot of you guys leagues is saying that you're banking on him scoring those 10 touchdowns again. And we've seen a lot more go wrong than we've seen go right with Green Bay Packers tight end Hype. And I, I've I've fallen for a lot of bad hypes, but the, the tight end in Green Bay has never been one of my faults. 
and I'm staying with my weights. That's why Jimmy Graham's down here, man. He is just a standard play. If you're in a full PPR league, he's an awful pick. Awful pick, though. So that's going to wrap up the 10 tight ends, man. I hope you enjoyed. If you did, hit that video with that thumbs up. Please drop a comment down below if y'all are interested in that draft weekend, man. It's going to be dope. It's going to be pretty expensive. I'll, I'll throw that up front because living in New York City for a weekend, Airbnb, food, this is going to be, everything is going to be all inclusive, all included. I'm like an all inclusive hotel, baby. I'm going to make sure the logistics is gorgeous for you. Being said, it'll be a little bit of a higher, higher price ticket, but it's still going to be a dope weekend an experience that I promise you, you will not forget. It will be awesome. So if you're interested, make sure you drop that comment below. Let me know you're interested. And uh, subscribe to the channel if you are new. I'll be hitting you with videos like this all summer. Let me know what you guys want to see on the next video as well. And in uh, and, 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 and the next video, I'll probably be back in New Jersey. It's okay. I'll enjoy my time out here for now. Peace, guys. Much love.